Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so it's uh, really nice to be here, and I'm very grateful to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so in the description on the web of the uh, objectives of the program and uh, of this workshop, uh, one point that's specifically mentioned is uh, identifying uh, the uh, Thales time in uh, many body systems. And as you see, that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, actually, I wrote my title and wrote the Thales time without thinking about it. But in a discussion with David Hughes yesterday, uh, I realized that I don't particularly want to defend uh, the particular type of Thales time that I'll be discussing as necessarily the crucial one. So uh, let me say at the beginning that there may well be other Thales times which are important for uh, other aspects of the physics. Uh, so uh, what I'm talking about is joint work with uh, Amos Chan and Andrea De Luca and Aaron Friedman. And uh, Amos was a graduate student in Oxford due to start at PCTS as a postdoc soon. Uh, Andrea was yes, uh, Andrea was a postdoc and has moved to a faculty position in Paris. And Aaron is a graduate student with Sid Paramesvaran. And the work I'm talking about is all either published or at least on the archive. Um, so the overall objective is to find some models for the ergodic phase in spatially extended many-body systems that are sufficiently simple that we can actually uh, do calculations. And um, there's a range of calculations which you might think it would be worth doing uh, and that we've looked at, uh, but the ones I'll focus on in this talk uh, are to do with the spectral properties of the system. Um, I mean, actually, if you claim that you're talking about an ergodic phase, probably the first task is to check uh, that uh, local observables relax in a microscopic time scale, and uh, that we've done. Um, and then also, obviously, in the context of current discussions, you might uh, want to discuss, say, the dynamics of entanglement, uh, entanglement growth, and so on. And, uh, for instance, the behavior of the out-of-time order correlator. And uh, we've studied those in, in at least one of the systems that I'll be talking about. Um, so the forerunner of the models that I'm going to describe uh, is in work on random unitary circuits. And uh, a number of groups have, have worked on this, but I've learned particularly from Adam Nahum and his collaborators. Um, so for people who haven't seen these models before, uh, they're represented in terms of uh, space time diagram like the one that I've got here. And in the space direction, we have a, a lattice. And it could be in higher dimensions. But of course, it's convenient to draw it in one dimension. Um, so on each of the lattice sites, you have uh, a, a Q-state quantum system, uh, some kind of generalized spin or, or Q-dit. And uh, as time goes by, uh, you evolve the system uh, in a sequence of discrete steps. And uh, at one of these steps, uh, neighboring sites get entangled by the action of a unitary matrix. And obviously, if you have uh, Q uh, states in Hilbert space on each site, then uh, this matrix is Q squared by Q squared. Um, and in the random unitary circuits that are studied in, in these papers, the simplicity comes from having each of these unitaries, both when you go from one place to another in space and when you go from one time slice to another, uh, to be uh, independent random quantities. And of course, the simple thing to do is to take them to be Ha 
unitary, uh, hard distributed. Did you say make this Q square by Q square? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, if you have Q states on each site, then in the Hilbert space for a pair of sites, you have Q st okay, states okay. because it's a many body system and so, yeah. Um, so, in these random unitary circuits, uh, the nature of the time evolution is changing as a function of time, and you could say this is a discretized version of unitary evolution under a time-dependent Hamiltonian, um, which is obviously an interesting thing to study, but uh, in particular, it doesn't really give you a way of thinking about spectral properties because you don't have a fixed time evolution operator that you can study. So the change that we made was to uh, go from these systems which are uh, varying in time uh, to flock A systems which are um, constructed in the same sort of way. And what I want to describe are results for three models. Um, so uh, one with sites that are strongly coupled in a way that I'll explain in a moment, uh, and then uh, that the results from that will make it clear that it's also interesting to look at a system where you have uh, some control over the strengths of coupling between sites. And um, both these first two models are Floquet systems with no additional features, and um, a consequence of them being Floquet systems is that there's no conserved density. I mean, of course, if you were evolving a system under a time-independent local Hamiltonian, then you would have uh, energy as a conserved density. And uh, in the sense that by going to a Floquet system, you abolish even energy as a conserved density, I think you could argue uh, that these uh, Floquet systems are maximally simple. Um, but of course, you would also like to understand the consequences of having uh, a locally conserved density. And uh, so the third example, which I want to talk about, is a Floquet system, uh, but one that's been constructed so that it has some degrees of freedom that, uh, that are conserved. OK, so um, the... First of the models that I want to talk about is um, shown here schematically using the same sort of notation as uh, what I introduced for um, random unitary circuits. Uh, so again, we have a lattice in space with uh, a local Hilbert space of, of dimension Q at each site. And um, the... Uh, flock A period is shown in the time direction here. In the uh, first half of the period, we uh, entangle sites across, uh, say, the even bonds, and in the second half of the period, we entangle sites uh, across the odd bonds. Um, and as I'll explain in a moment, when you uh, come to think about physical quantities, what you're uh, required to calculate is uh, properties, and, and I should say we calculate all properties averaged over the choice of these unitaries uh, with a hard distribution. You're, you're required to calculate properties of uh, uh, products of powers of the uh, Floquet operator, uh, or in the case of random unitary circuits, the uh, evolution operator. And in the case of random unitary circuits, because the uh, unitary gates that act are independent at each time step, uh, you have a given gate only uh, appearing some finite number of times in, in a calculation of the physical quantities you're interested in. So... In those problems, you can do calculations uh, for uh, any size of the local Hilbert space. Um, but when we go to Floquet models, we have uh, 
multiple copies of a given unitary appearing uh, in the quantities we want to calculate. So uh, we can only actually do calculations in the large Q limit, and, and that's where the uh, simplicity comes in. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you could either have open or periodic boundary conditions. And you can calculate some quantities where uh, the effects of boundary conditions come in. In, in W2, the line goes through. Is that the matter of drawing? Uh, well, it's a matter of drawing, but uh, l let me just specify things formally. So you can define evolution operators uh, for the two halves of uh, the Floquet period, and then the overall ev evolution operator is a product of the two. And the way I've drawn things here with uh, open boundary conditions, then one of these operators will be a, a direct product of, of unitaries representing each of these gates, and the other one with these lines going straight through will have some uh, unit operators appearing. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the first of the three models that we want to study, and, and now let me move on and talk about the uh, quantities we'll be calculating. Um, so to um, characterize the spectra, well, we think about the um, evolution operator or uh, its power t, where t is uh, an integer. So um, it has eigenvalues in terms of these uh, eigenphases, theta n, and uh, what we'll calculate is the spectral form factor, which we heard about in talks uh, uh, yesterday and, and, and on Monday. And uh, in terms of the uh, evolution operator for t time steps, it's simply the modular squared of the trace. So for orientation, we can think about uh, just a single n by n uh, random matrix from the uh, circular uh, uh, ensemble. And um, in that case, the behavior of the spectral form factor is, is particularly simple. Uh, there's uh, a Heisenberg time, which in these units is the size of the matrix, and uh, beyond the Heisenberg time, the spectral form factor is simply uh, n, the, the size of the matrix, and uh, uh, at earlier times it, it ramps up linearly, and the fact that the spectral form factor is uh, much smaller than its large time value uh, at early times is, of course, a reflection of um, spectral rigidity. And... Um, because we're talking about the spectral form factor without any of the eigenvector information uh, that we were hearing about in uh, Leo Santos's talk yesterday, um, the short time behavior is, is very simple. Uh, and the analog to the short time peak that she was showing, uh, I haven't even drawn on this picture, but you can see that if I take uh, time zero, then k of t is in fact just uh, the dimension n uh, squared uh, of the matrix, so you should imagine a very large initial peak there. Um, now, in single particle extended systems, we uh, do know the kind of uh, effect that comes in when you go to a system that's more complicated than, than just random matrix theory. And, uh, for instance, in mesoscopic conductors, uh, we have the idea of the Thales time. And from uh, work originally by uh, Altshuler and Shklovsky, uh, we know that at uh, times uh, shorter than the Thales time, the spectral form factor takes values bigger than uh, what you would expect according to random matrix theory, which is basically telling you that at short times, uh, different parts of the system uh, have spectral fluctuations that are independent of each other because uh, the, the system, if you like, hasn't, hasn't coupled. Would you intentionally drive going into zero at the very shortest time? Or is, there... um, is there a simple explanation? Well, of course, in uh, 
Alshin Lushkovsky and in most of the discussions in um, the context of mesoscopics, people talk about things in the uh, energy domain. Um, and I guess I drew it like this, anticipating the results that we get in many body systems. So you do get a result like that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, let, let's come back to that later. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, one point I, I should make here, a simple point, that um, uh, we're really thinking of t taking integer values here because it's a Floquet system and. But actually, this vanishing is simply the conservation of the total number of, uh, of degrees of freedom. But it is, it is basically a sum rule. So yeah. if you say finite system, which has finite number of degrees of freedom, you always get zero at zero. If you then... Uh, mm -hmm. But at zero, as he said, it's actually n squared. Yeah. yeah. So, so, the, so the sum rule... Right, because it is, the sum rule uh, is very only for finite system. If you go first to third dynamic limit, it will go... Well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, what you what you could do is calculate the uh, connected version of this, which would subtract off the peak at uh, t equals zero, uh, and then it would be guaranteed to be zero. At, it, it, it would be guaranteed to be zero at t equals zero. But uh, what I'm suggesting is that it goes. Uh, towards zero, so it's small even at t equals one, which is what we find, and uh, yeah. Um, okay, so that's what we want to study, in fact, in each of these three models, um, and um, here are the results for the uh, strongly coupled Floquet model, which uh, I've, I've introduced, and um, the, the result is uh, extremely simple. Uh, you might even say disappointingly simple. Uh, the spectral form factor uh, has the um, random matrix form uh, for all times that we can calculate. And in this large Q limit, what we can do is calculations for uh, Q goes to infinity with uh, T finite and system size finite. And, but in that limit, uh, this is really quite controlled and, and uh, an exact result. Um, oh, sorry, it's the length of the chain. Length of the chain, yeah. Um, so you, you might feel that that's kind of deeply unimpressive because you started with lots of random matrices and then in the end you've got a random matrix result out. But actually, I'd like to argue that there's more to it than that. And um, one way of arguing that there's more to it than that is to uh, think about uh, a minor modification of the model that we actually solved, where you leave out half of these unitaries so that instead of having a system that's all coupled together, you have uh, a lot of independent pairs of sites. And then it's trivial to see that what you get for the spectral form factor is much bigger. It's uh, t to the power of the number of pairs of sites. And in a system of length L, that's L over 2. So um, it, it really is uh, a non-trivial result to get random matrix behavior uh, and uh, to see how it comes from uh, the coupling between sites. Um, and uh, what I want to go on to next is, well, first a bit of an indication of how it happens, and then uh, a discussion of how things can change if you have uh, less strong coupling between the sites. Uh, and uh, uh, I suppose the direction I'm heading in is that to have such simple behavior is uh, partly because we've gone to the large Q limit. Does it mean that spectral spectrum is exactly? Yes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, 
the, so the Heisenberg time uh, is Q to the L, and the calculations break down as you approach the Heisenberg time, but that's the least likely place to have deviations from random matrix behavior, uh, because uh, if we go back to the energy domain, that's uh, obviously on the finest energy scales where you really generally expect random matrix theory to work. Okay, uh, so I'd like to talk a bit about how the result comes out and uh, then suggest what else can happen. Um, so uh, we can think of the spectral form factor as the modular squared of the trace of the evolution operator. And uh, then if we think of the evolution operator for t time steps, uh, we can think of that trace uh, in terms of some path uh, through the uh, space of, of many body states. Um, and um, when we think about terms that contribute to the uh, modular squared of the trace, then it's easy to argue, and this is familiar in other contexts, that uh, what will be important will be the uh, diagonal terms in this double sum. So, um, of course, in low-dimensional quantum chaos, uh, people talk about the diagonal approximation, and in d disordered conductors, people talk about diffusons, and uh, it's exactly the same here. Uh, the point is that uh, the terms in this sum will have fluctuating phases, and uh, it's only when we pair contributions from uh, w and w dagger uh, by taking uh, uh, two copies of the same path uh, that the uh, phase fluctuations uh, cancel out. Um, and uh, so if you represent that diagrammatically with the uh, path that's giving us a uh, trace of w, say in blue, and the path that's giving us uh, w dagger in green, uh, then uh, these links represent pairings. And the key point is that there are t possible pairings because you can shift, uh, say, the green path relative to the uh, blue path um, in uh, discrete time steps. Uh, so the uh, fact that the spectral form factor is linear in t comes uh, exactly from this number of possible pairings. Okay, so, so the question then is, um, can something more happen in many body systems? And uh, what I want to argue is, of course, that it can. And what you can imagine, so I if we think of the many body system with the space direction this way and time that way, and then the uh, blue cylinder represents my uh, blue loop and the green cylinder the, the green loop, uh, then in one region of space you could have one of these T pairings and in a different region of space you have a different pairing uh, with some kind of uh, domain wall between them. Um, and uh, you can guess and uh, then show in a lot of detail as I'll sketch in a minute that you might have an equivalence to a T-state POTS model because uh, the uh, possible pairings in one region uh, correspond to uh, T possible states for some <laughs> local degree of freedom. And you can also imagine that there's some kind of statistical cost uh, for the walls between different types of pairing. Um, so that's the picture. And now I want to introduce the second of these three models that I'm going to uh, discuss, uh, which is set up so that we can look at that physics in a controlled way. Um, uh, and again, we have uh, a lattice of sites uh, with uh, a two-dimensional local Hilbert space on each site. Um, and again, we're studying a flock A problem. Um, but now in order to have controllable coupling between the sites and also a large Q limit which allows us to uh, solve the problem, um, the 
two parts to a flock A time step, uh, we'll first of all uh, do some uh, unitary rotation on each of the sites independently, uh, and uh, then secondly, uh, couple the sites together in uh, a way that includes uh, a coupling strength as a, a parameter. So um, the first half of the time step is just some direct product of hard distributed unitaries acting on the individual sites. And the um, second half of the time step, uh, well, I guess you could make lots of choices, but something which is uh, simple to handle is to have uh, a diagonal unitary matrix with phases which depend on the uh, states of adjacent sites. And uh, then for convenience, you take these phases to be Gaussian random variables with some width, uh, epsilon, which will be the strength of the coupling. So uh, if you take this uh, width to zero, then uh, this matrix W2 uh, is just the unit matrix uh, and the sites are uncoupled. Uh, but if you let um, epsilon be large, then uh, the uh, phase fluctuations on the diagonal of uh, W2 uh, are large and the sites are uh, strongly coupled together. Um, and then you can imagine that as a function of time, uh, this uh, coupling uh, becomes more important uh, at long times. And um, so you can imagine uh, that you might get a crossover between the behavior for uncoupled sites at short times, which would be spectral form factor growing like uh, a power of t from each site in the system, so t to the l, um, and at long times uh, crossing over to this random matrix behavior. And uh, in the model that I described in the large Q limit, you have, in fact, an exact mapping to a T-state pot sphere magnet. Um, so the coupling in the pots model corresponds to the uh, strength of the phase fluctuations times time uh, in the uh, flock A system. And in fact, uh, the spectral form factor is just the same as the uh, partition function for the POTS model if you choose the zero of energy uh, appropriately. Uh, and then, of course, um, the one-dimensional POTS model you can solve easily. And uh, in higher dimensions, you have uh, a good enough understanding of what happens that uh, you uh, know exactly what happens to the uh, spectral form factor. So in one dimension, uh, of course, it's a feature that uh, the POTS model doesn't have uh, a phase transition. Uh, and uh, that means that we have uh, a Thaulis time uh, which diverges as a function of system size. Um, and a convenient way to think about the spectral form factor is um, in the same kind of parameterization that I think Thomas Gur used. Um, so uh, at short times, it's much larger than t, and uh, we can write it as t to the power l divided by some correlation length. And the picture here is that the system is breaking up into uh, domains of size uh, xi, and each domain is contributing independently to the uh, spectral fluctuations. Uh, but um, because the uh, POTS coupling grows as you go to uh, longer times, uh, this uh, correlation length grows, in fact, rather rapidly as a function of time. And for a fixed size system, uh, at sufficiently long times, uh, this would be bigger than the system size, and then you cross over to uh, the whole system uh, contributing coherently to uh, spectral fluctuations and go over to uh, random matrix behavior. Uh, and from the solution of the POTS model, you get a, uh, an explicit result for the dependence of the correlation length on time, and uh, you can identify uh, the 
time scale at which the correlation length matches the size of the system. And uh, what you find is that this is a, a surprisingly short time. Uh, the uh, Thales time uh, only grows uh, logarithm logarithmically uh, with system size. So that's, um, in other words, we're reaching random matrix uh, uh, spectral fluctuations uh, much faster than any uh, signal could uh, propagate across the system. Uh, but I think that's okay be because uh, there's really no reason to imagine that spectral fluctuations are to do with uh, propagation of, of quantum information. Uh, so, so that's the behavior in a one-dimensional system. And uh, if you go to higher dimensions, then uh, for large T, the POTS model has a phase transition, which is, um, in fact, strongly first order. And uh, that uh, corresponds to having uh, a, a Thales time, which is, which is finite. Kink in the spectral form factor? Just what happens at the transition in the spectral form factor? Uh, well, the um, for the floquet system, t takes integer values, right. and it's small, small enough, so uh, it happens at some very uh, and you can make it happen at some large t. Uh, you'd have to fine tune epsilon to have the Phase transition coincide with uh, integer t. Uh, well, but as you vary t, you go through the transition. Yeah, yeah, but t you vary t through integer values. So in general, the transition will not be a, uh, one of the discrete time steps. But you could make that as fine as possible. So uh, yeah, y yes, 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 you, you, yeah, you could get, you could get close. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, I, I, as you say, it should be. Uh, it, it should be some kink in the uh, in K of T. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and you think it hap You think the Thales time ends up corresponding to the? No, that's not what you're saying. First order transition finite Thales time. Are you saying the Thales time is at the transition? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Heisenberg time is again yeah, so the Heisenberg time is way, way out, uh, much larger times. Uh, okay, um, so going back to, to one dimension, simply plotting the results, this is uh, what you get from the large Q calculation. So this is the uh, spectral form factor as a function of time. Uh, for uh, a sequence of uh, different system sizes. And uh, you see this short time peak uh, gets bigger as you go to larger systems. So that's consistent with the idea that at short times in a uh, very weakly coupled system, K of T should go like T to the power L. Uh, and uh, beyond the Thales time, you come back to um, random matrix behavior. And uh, the Thales time is increasing uh, but rather slowly uh, as you increase system size. If you compare this to the number carriers, uh, what is the speed and difference? Um, yeah, I've... Uh, so I, I've spent some time trying to think about converting to a number variance, but of course, in principle, you need to Fourier transform to get back to energy, and in principle for that, you need the behavior of the spectral form factor at all times. And uh, there, there's a formula related to the number of carriers to the spectral form factor. Yes, sure, sure. But, uh, but what we have here are results for the spectral form factor at early times. And uh, to do that for a transform, uh, you need the, the whole result. And uh, there are some features which I, one knows from some rules must be fixed in the long time behavior that I haven't got a full handle on. So, so the final answer is that we don't have results for number variance. But considering that, that, the, uh, that the Heisenberg time is way out here, yeah. I, I would think that it happens at a very large end, at very large end of the end. So you have, 
for, for very large energy overlays where it's all animated. Yes. 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 Yeah, I'm, I've spent some time thinking about it, and I'm not confident that I've got the right answer. I'd be happy to discuss, but... Uh, Right, sure. So, so it's just a, a rather small increase here. Well, I mean, this is just plotting. This is plotting an analytic formula. So that I can do. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, what I want to move on to is some numerics. So, uh, as I've said, all this is for for the large Q limit. Uh, but uh, we also did numerics on on this exact same model uh, for finite Q. And uh, for orientation, I guess the first point is to think about the phase diagram. Uh, so um, at uh, finite Q in general, uh, you'd expect that uh, if the coupling between sites is large enough, you uh, should get into the ergodic phase. But uh, for small uh, coupling between the sites, there's a possibility of an MBL phase. Uh, and so uh, somewhere in the plane of uh, the number of states Q and the strength of the coupling, uh, there should be a, a phase boundary. Um, and we looked uh, a little bit numerically at uh, where that uh, phase boundary lies. Uh, and firstly, in, in the large Q limit, uh, essentially... Uh, the, the, the MBL phase uh, shrinks to zero uh, and, and things are, are ergodic. Uh, but at finite Q, uh, there's a, a transition. In, in fact, at Q equals two, uh, the system seems to be MBL for all values of epsilon. Uh, I mean, the point is basically that since uh, uh, the coupling between sites is a random phase, uh, if you make the um, variance of the phase of order one, there's nothing that you can do to go to even stronger coupling. Um, so uh, these figures here are of the R statistic, the ratio of uh, nearest neighbor spacings. Um, and the lower value is the one that you expect in uh, an MBL phase. And the upper uh, value is the one that you expect in an ergodic phase. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the horizontal axis is the strength of the coupling, and we see a transition. This is for the three-state model uh, between an, an MBL phase at, at weak coupling and an ergodic phase at, at strong coupling, and then in the inset, we've got results at Q equals 2, and uh, you see only uh, the uh, MBL phase. Um, Okay, so these, these are numerics in the ergodic phase for K of T uh, for a sequence of different system sizes. And if you focus first on this uh, blue line, which is the smallest system size, then uh, the uh, Heisenberg time is about here, and you see K of T more or less linear in T and then saturating. Um, but if you focus still on early times and go to larger system sizes, then uh, you see this big peak, which is uh, the deviation from uh, random matrix theory, uh, which is getting more and more significant in larger systems, uh, as uh, we expected from the um, results in the large Q limit. Um, and then, just for the sake of completeness, you can also... Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, it, it certainly does. And uh, uh, I, I can think of various reasons why it might go faster at finite Q. Uh, so, um, for instance, weak links uh, from... So you're saying the log L might not apply. It's not clear. Yeah, yeah. Is it trying to change Q? I mean, numerically you can go to those Q or uh, right, so uh, our original plan was to study Q equals 2, 
Uh, and so uh, it was a bit of a blow to discover that this model only uh, has an MBL phase at Q equals 2. Uh, so I was quite relieved when things worked at Q equals 3, uh, where we could access the ergodic phase, uh, but uh, I haven't, uh, we haven't tried Q equals 4. But, uh, um, okay, so for completeness... Uh, I thought I'd show results for the spectral form factor in the MBL phase, uh, and uh, these are results for, for a smaller system and a, a larger system, uh, and uh, the dashed lines are what, we, what you would have in random matrix theory. Uh, so the point is that um, you reach uh, the uh, long time value of order Q to the L, uh, in uh, a time scale that's uh, a, a microscopic time. And there would probably be some more detailed analysis that you could do on this, uh, which would relate it to uh, the distribution of very small level spacings in the MBL phase, and that might be interesting, but I haven't, haven't done that. Um, okay, so the last topic which uh, I'd like to talk about is this uh, third Floquet model, and um, as I mentioned, the point here is that the first two models I've talked about, uh, because they're Floquet systems, uh, don't have any conserved densities. And um, if you want to use uh, these results as guidance for thinking about time evolution in systems with time-independent Hamiltonians, uh, then uh, you are interested in the conserved density because uh, those uh, systems with time uh, independent Hamiltonians at the very least have uh, energy as a conserved density. Uh, so the idea is to construct uh, something that's still a Floquet model in order that we're able to uh, get a handle on things, uh, but to build in uh, a conserved density. And, and I forgot to put the references on the slide, but I, I should say that we were following things that uh, people had done in uh, random unitary circuits. Um, so the model in terms of this space-time diagram looks uh, just the same as the uh, one that I talked about first with uh, strong coupling between uh, the, the sites. Uh, but now we have, uh, instead of Q states per site, uh, two Q states per site, which we think of as uh, Q uh, color-like degrees of freedom, which are the kinds of degrees of freedom that uh, uh, the previous model was based on, uh, direct product with some uh, degree of freedom that's going to be conserved, which you can think of as a, a spin or a, a pseudospin. Um, and uh, these uh, unitaries then should have uh, a block structure uh, in uh, the Hilbert space of the, the two sites that they couple, um, chosen in exactly the way you need uh, to uh, allow these pseudospins to hop between adjacent sites, um, but always with, with conservation. So... Um, in the block where the pseudospins at neighboring sites have the same uh, orientation, uh, you just mix together the color degrees of freedom. Uh, but uh, in the block where you have opposite orientations, you also have the possibility of uh, transferring uh, a spin from one site to its neighbor. Um, so again, you can do an exact calculation and the way the calculation works is that you, uh, it's convenient to think about averaging over these degrees of freedom in two steps. And uh, first of all, you average over these uh, color degrees of freedom. And uh, that means that only the uh, diagonal terms uh, in the expression for the uh, spectral form factor survive. Uh, but uh, you've still got to sum over the locations of these spin degrees of freedom. And um, 
in this calculation that gets mapped onto a hardcore lattice gas or a spin a half quantum ferromagnet and uh, of course we know a great deal uh, about the properties of a system like that so um, the outcome of that calculation is that in this system with a conserved density uh, we have uh, a Thales time uh, which is uh, controlled by the system size and uh, a diffusion constant in exactly the same way as happens in uh, a single particle system uh, in one dimension. And um, we have a, a form for the spectral form factor, which is um, a contribution linear in T, as you would have from random matrix theory, which comes from the T possible pairings between uh, the two uh, reverse paths uh, multiplied uh, by a, a factor which is basically the partition function for this uh, hardcore lattice gas or, or spin half ferromagnet and um, you can write down an uh, explicit expression for it uh, but basically uh, the scaling variable is uh, time in units of the uh, Thales time and at uh, times much longer than Thales time, uh, this uh, factor goes to one, uh, and at short times, uh, it's much larger than one. Um, and again, uh, you can do some uh, numerics. Um, so uh, this inset is uh, a plot of the spectral form factor as a function of time uh, for a sequence of... Uh, uh, this is... Well, um, yeah, Q equals one. Um, kind of particular of Sulevskovsky dimension. Um, uh, how do you mean? I mean this capital F of X, X yes. one half. That correspond to some, if I think about it as a Schulich-Klovsky result, that correspond to some particular dimensionality. Uh, well, it probably would be quasi one dimensional. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, sorry, I haven't actually thought back about uh, to, to how this might relate to the single particle problem, uh, or w whether it relates at that level of detail, but, but, but perhaps, perhaps it does. Um, yeah, okay, so, so the, the spectral form factor is a function of time uh, for the three system sizes that we've looked at so far. Uh, you see that at a given time, as you go to large systems, you have uh, larger deviations from uh, random matrix theory. Sorry, I, I should have emphasized that actually the label hasn't come out properly here. Uh, this is uh, the logarithm of the spectral form factor divided by the random matrix theory result which would simply be t so uh, when the curves come down to the uh, horizontal axis then uh, k of t is refer is returning to uh, random matrix behavior uh, so so the inset is is the raw results and then if we rescale things uh, in terms of the scaling variable, then uh, the data, at least for the largest two system sizes, uh, more or less collapse on top of each other. Um, you are here just referring to the symmetry, not the size of the system. So what is Q? Just one. Q, Q is. I think U1 here. Here U1 just means that it's a U1 symmetry. Yeah, I, I just mean that it's the, the there's a conserved density, which is these pseudo spins. Okay. The local dimension of which is one? Uh, two. Two. This is yeah. no color. Yeah. And this doesn't come down like the other one did. Um, or, or. Uh, I, yeah, uh, I think that's just been cut off, that early time behavior. Yeah. This is normalized, so it's, it's t to the one half if you don't normalize it, so it goes to zero anyway. Um, Could you divide it out the, yeah. the t? Maybe. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. On this plug, when, when is approximately the earliest time here? Um, well, uh, you know, ra round about here or somewhere. Yeah. I mean, my, may, yeah, maybe one if you like. Can, can you continue this? Yeah, sure. So if you continue further, it just uh, asymptotes to the to the yes. axis. There was no sharp sign. No, no, no. I mean, it's. I, I'm sure it would only ever be a crossover. Except in your case where you had a phase transition. Uh, yes, all right, yes. Yeah. Well, all right, uh, yes. Yeah, but that's presumably likely to be a special result of large Q. Yeah. Okay, um, so, I mean, I have plenty more that I could say uh, after the summary slide, but uh, let me talk about the summary. So, so I guess the... the First and most important point is that uh, by thinking about these Floquet models at large Q, we can actually get uh, solvable ergodic phases. And we can calculate, we have calculated lots more uh, aside from uh, the spectral form factor that I've talked about uh, to do with entanglement growth and, uh, for instance, the OTOC. Um, and uh, then uh, as far as the spectral form factor is concerned, uh, we have uh, spectral fluctuations which are much bigger than in random matrix theory uh, at early times, uh, but uh, at times later than uh, this candidate for the Thales time, uh, we cross over to random matrix behavior. And um, the uh, Thales time varies with system size, and, of course, it's, it's significant if it diverges with system size because that gives you the possibility of having uh, universal behavior uh, that's different from random matrix theory in uh, a wide window so long as the, the Thales time goes to infinity. And uh, then we have these specific results uh, without a conserved density, the Thales time growing logarithmically with system size and uh, with a conserved density growing like uh, system size squared. Thanks. Well, thanks so much. Uh, do the random unit theories always couple on neighboring sides as in your figure? Or do you also, on the question would be, does it depend on the results on well, they couple also any other side. So what is, depends on the connectivity? Um, yeah, I, I, I think there would be a strong dependence on connectivity. I mean, uh, you could imagine making a model without any spatial structure, but still, say, with two-site couplings. Uh, and uh, uh, I assume that you get to random matrix theory... Uh, faster, but I haven't I haven't done concrete calculations. Yeah, kind of the question of the interpretation of your very fast Taoist time. Yeah. Uh, can I think about this without consideration loss? In first step, you establish level repulsion between say boxes of size one, then boxes of size two, and boxes of size four, and then you kind of see that you can move exponentially. Is it the right picture or? Oh, right. Well, I, I've spent some time trying to uh, think about uh, RG procedures that would uh, uh, give a different way of deriving this result. And actually, that logarithmic dependence on L doesn't come out of RG very easily, so far as I can see. Um, I, and, uh, well, I... In yeah, right. So in the first step, you only couple, I don't know, uh, say... Uh, some links, some pairs of links, mm. so that you establish this, like in, in one of your pictures, like one and two, then three and four. Then in the next step, you can couple pairs of logs. And mm -hmm. the next is sort of like numerical way of doing RG. Sure. You know, probably you can yeah. Um, well, uh, so I have tried that, and I haven't, uh, haven't got anywhere with it, but it would be good to talk more. Uh, Lee Robinson Bam, says that on the Thales time, different parts of the system know nothing about each other. Yes. 
Yes, but uh, but that's right. But uh, uh, but you could still think about what happens to the levels when you couple blocks together and then couple two larger blocks and so on. Do you see any evidence of getting MBL and avoid equations or anything else? Um, well, I haven't looked, and uh, of course, the numer the analytical results are in the large Q limit, where we don't have an MBL phase, or we'd have to scale epsilon to zero uh, as Q went to infinity to get an MBL phase. Uh, Could you get an MBL phase now? Uh, well, I think you could, but it, it's, uh, th there are particular difficulties in doing the calculation. Of course, I've thought about it. But, uh, um, and in the numerics, we haven't looked so hard at details of the transition. Uh, I mean, my picture for what happens as you approach the MBL transition is that this Thales time gets longer and longer and uh, well bas basically two things have got to happen uh, this Thales time has got to approach the Heisenberg time and the uh, maximum in this early time peak has got to approach the value n uh, that you would have uh, and so I think you can imagine how you evolve from, from this to the localized phase. Uh, and, it doesn't, uh, and if you think about that, there's no particular reason why you should have something else intermediate. But Just trying to think about the old you know, nuclear physics, you know, the, the way you understood the random matrix behavior, the Thales time was the time to put it by the mu of the neutron, you know, mm -hmm. colliding in the nucleus, and then it takes some time to pairwise collision to, to put it by the nucleus. And this was the interpretation of the Thales time. So I wonder if you can think about the Thales time here as somehow the time it takes to somehow be put it by the whole system. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yes. Well, I, I mean, the difficulty with that is uh, that in um, the systems without a conserved density, the Thales time is so short that, as David just said, we, we know no, no signals can propagate. So uh, that kind of... That I, I think that, that undermines uh, that way of thinking, although I agree it's... So, so what is the number of realizations you use for this figure? Um, is it millions or thousands? Uh, uh, tens of thousands, probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and did you have to do any additional smoothing to calculate? Um, of course, for non-compact systems, you have to do that. Uh, no, I don't think this state has been smoothed. Uh, the, I mean, there are some funny things. There's an odd-even effect as a function of time, and so it, it's much better to look even at, uh, either at the even time steps or at the odd time steps rather than to put them both on the same graph. Uh, but, um, but I didn't see anything peculiar beyond that. So last question. Yeah, I mean, I also, young, to your point, I also thought about that a lot. I mean, in, in the old nuclear physics days, people would have spoken about five peak nodes because they, they completely, I mean, there was no reason to think about the dimensionality of the system. So they looked at the, at the energy spectrum and I kind of, then I have the Lorentzian and that's a five peak nodes, and the inverse gives some time scale. But what here in these systems is so important is the dimensionality, and that always enters <laughs> in the soundest energy and time. Discussions very much. 
because it's an issue that I don't think in the old nuclear physics days really occurred. Nick? It just could have been small. 